They, they can't watch the live yet because I just did the Google verification this morning. But they can see Wednesday and Sunday. So, like last week, I did it as soon as I got home. Yeah, Google hasn't approved us to go live on YouTube yet. Good morning. We're coming live to you this morning on Facebook from White Sulphur Baptist Church here in Scott County. Hope you join us. We're excited about these days and what God is doing. And before I get into the announcements and some other things we need to talk about, we want to open in prayer this morning. Have one of our deacons, Tim Abbott, come and lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are open. Holy, 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 your Lord is with you. The great comfort in those words, Father, thank you. You're in control. In these times that we're going through trouble, we can know the beginning and the end. You're there. Help us to use these times to put our trust in you and not in man. Help us to trust in your your provision and not in the things of this world. Father, we pray for those that are hurting, whether it's physically or sickness, or because of job loss and unemployment. We pray that you'll meet those needs, give comfort, give peace in them. We pray for our leaders, Father. We pray for our president, for our governor, and for their advisors. We know that their hearts are in your hands. They'll be led by you. They'll follow your lead. They'll do, do what you need to do. We pray that you'll be with our country. We pray for those in the church, for our leaders, that we we'll all come together and that we'll use this time to give you the honor and the glory. Your name be lifted up. We praise you. We see that you're the one that. Tim, and it wasn't long ago that we were in such a fast-paced world, and uh, things have kind of slowed a little bit. I heard where you can uh, take a gallon of gas now and get three weeks out of that. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how things have changed? Well, we're excited about our church, and if you have a special prayer request or need to talk with the pastor or need some uh, help, uh, you're welcome to call area code 502. It's 863-6224. And also for our offerings, as we continue to send those, we've opened up a field box up in Georgetown, Kentucky. 
The old box is 2081. If you want to send a prayer request along with your offering, uh, we certainly be excited to receive those as well. Well, this is Palm Sunday, and uh, a week from today is, uh, some might refer to it as Easter Sunday, but on Resurrection Sunday, we've got a special event coming. We're going to have the parking lot full. I hope you'll come and attend us. And with us, we're going to, uh, to park out there and then have a live broadcast with the speakers and Brother John Cravens will bring that message. So if you know someone, uh, this will be a great time. And we're going to ask that you, uh, that you kind of park a distance from each other. Now, the parking lot is marked off out there. But if you pull in, I know we're required to be six foot apart. But with the windows down and the breeze might be blowing, we've asked you to park maybe every other space. So just keep that in mind. It wouldn't it be great uh, to once again fellowship? Uh, I miss seeing you all. I miss the, the hugs and the handshakes and, you know, and joining together as Christian men and women here in the house of God. And someday that will be back to normal, I hope. So don't miss next Sunday. What eight, day that's going to be? At uh, 8 o'clock. Yes, the service is at 8 o'clock. It's not a sunrise, but pretty close to it. And thank you for saying that. 8 o'clock, Sunday morning. And uh, that will be a great time for us. I mentioned the offering already and our prayer time and just keep our prayer, uh, our church in, in your prayer life and in your time because I tell you, these are difficult times. and People are hurting all across this country. And uh, again, God is in control. Uh, God is on his throne and God will take care of us. Well, again, uh, during these times, I usually end with a little quick story. I heard about the lady who run outside. She'd been in quarantine for some time, rang the doorbell and then run back inside and hollered, who is it? Brother John Cravens, will you come and lead our message this morning? Thank you. Well, good morning again on week three of these uh, unusual times. And uh, I'm grateful that even if we can't be all together, we can at least do it in this fashion. So I'm grateful that God has provided for this. So if you have your Bible this morning, we're going to be turning to Isaiah chapter 7. While you're turning there, I heard a, a story this morning that I'm told, when you told it, said it was a true story. And I thought it fit very well with uh, the message that uh, we're going to have this morning. As uh, the story is that this guy was, uh, he was recruiting for, um, for college sports and he was in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And they say that's very country. And, uh, you know, a lot of farmers, and they have a lot of mules. They have mule day there in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And these farmers, they plow with their mules. So this guy was driving along on this dusty road, and he slid up into a ditch and could not get his truck out of that ditch. And so he got out, and he began to look around for some help, and he saw a farmer out there plowing in the field with his mule. And he called to that farmer and said, can you, can you give me a, a phone? I need some help. I need to get my truck out of the ditch. And that uh, farmer said, oh, we'll come over with my mule here and my mule will pull you out of that ditch. And he's like, no, no, I need a phone. We need a truck if we want to get this out of here. And he says, no, I, I'll come over there. My mule will pull you out of that ditch. And this guy's like, I don't know going to work. It's probably going to kill this mule. I'm going to pay for a mule on top of everything else. But this farmer came over with his mule and hooked it up to the truck. And then he said, come on, Jim. Come on, Bob. Come on, Dan. That old mule didn't move. He said, come on, Dusty. And that mule started moving. Boom, boom, boom. And pulled that truck right out of that ditch. Well, the guy was, was grateful and he was getting ready to leave. He says, man, what was it with all those other names you were saying to that mule? He says, oh, that mule is blind. And if he thought he was pulling by himself, he wouldn't pull. So, <laughs> Well, the good news is that we are not alone. Even in the midst of all of this stuff that we're going through right now, the message today is that you are not alone. So as we look in the scripture this morning, I want to talk about the name that calms our fears. When I say that, the name that may come to your mind is the name Jesus. Jesus calms our fears. And there's many names for Jesus. We're going to see some of those names in the scripture this morning, all of which calms our fears. Also, Isaiah has some children, and his children 
have names that are significant. In chapter 18, he says that his children were given for signs and for wonders. So the names had significance. And he could look at his children and think of those names and would calm his fears. So let's just look at the context of what's going on in Isaiah's day. There in chapter, uh, verse 1 of chapter 7, about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Razan, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. Now here's the situation of the day. There's a superpower in that time known as Assyria. They were a major threat. And these two kings, what they want to do is they want to form an alliance. They want Judah to be a part of that alliance so that they can defend themselves against Assyria. But the king of Judah, which is Ahaz, he is not for that. He is pro-Assyria. So the plan here is that they would come in and conquer Judah. They would remove Ahaz from being king. And according to verse 6, put their own king upon the throne and form this alliance. So as they come and as they are seeking to wage war, uh, we read of the reaction to this in verse 2. It says, When it was reported to the house of David, saying, The Arameans have camped in Ephraim, his heart and the hearts of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. So what a picture that is of fear. We think about someone quaking in their boots or someone whose knees are knocking. They're, 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 they're shaking. They're, they're trembling in fear. And you can imagine why that would be the case. An army getting ready to come in. They don't know what's going to happen. Are they going to be killed in this? Uh, is their lives going to be forever altered? And so there is great fear. And there can be great fear today in the time in which we're living. We know that there are many who are very fearful. Some are fearful for their health. They are very concerned for whether or not they would get this virus and what it would do to them. And others who may have the virus uh, are concerned and worried, am I going to make it? Am I going to be able to uh, survive this? And there are those, of course, who work with those people who are sick, and they have fears regarding this. And then there's economic fears, and what's going on with the economy, and how many people have lost their jobs, and well, what's going to happen? Are they going to get those jobs back? How's the economy going to look when all this is over? What's going to happen? And so there's a great deal of fear. And anytime there's a crisis and anytime there's a possibility of devastating effects, there is often fear, fear of uncertainty. But the good news for us as the children of God is that we have no reason to fear. And that is the message that Isaiah has for Ahaz there in verse Three. It says, Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son, Shir Jashu. Now you thought your name was bad. Shir Jashu. And that name means a remnant shall return. So his son's names had significance. So he is told to take his son out there. There's a message there in his son. But he's going to go out to meet Ahaz. It says at the end of of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. It would appear that Ahaz is going out to check the water supply. In light of this possible invasion here, he wants to check to see how they're doing with their water. Whenever there's a crisis, sometimes people check on their supplies. Do we have enough? Are we going to be able to make it? I think there's a lot of that kind of concern going on today. People are stockpiling resources, some of which make sense. Some of it I'm not so sure of. Uh, why there's such a run on toilet paper, I don't know. I mean, it's nice to have, sure, but you can live without it. But, but people are stockpiling other things. They're stockpiling food and uh, other things. And, and the reason that they're doing that is simply fear. There is this fear that maybe in the near future that everything's going to be shut down. Grocery stores are going to be shut down. And you're not going to be allowed to go out of your house. And the only thing that you're going to have is what's in your house. And if you don't have enough of it, and if you run out of it, then you're just going to be without it. And if you run out of food, then you're not going to have any food. What are we going to do then? It's where I want to start to death. So everybody, there's a lot of fear that's driving that kind of thing. But the message here is that we don't have to be afraid. This is what Isaiah says to King Ahaz in verse 4. It says, And say to him, 
Take care and be calm. And have no fear. And do not be faint-hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands on account of the fierce anger of Raisin and Aram and the son of Remaliah. Isaiah says, you don't have to worry about these two kings. No reason to fear at all. He tells him, as you read on, that the plans that they have, they will not come to pass. And he says, in fact, in a very quick period of time, these two kings are going to disappear. The land in which they rule over is going to be uh, destroyed. So there's no reason to, to, to be afraid here. But then he says, at the end of verse 9, something very significant. He says, if you will not believe, you surely shall not last. So there's a choice here for King Ahaz. Are you going to believe what God has said? Are you going to put your trust in him? If you will not trust in him, he says, you will not last. You see, what's the cure for fear? The cure for fear is faith, our faith in God. Where there is faith, there will not be fear. And where there is fear, it's an absence of faith. Someone may say, well, I trust in God. Boy, I sure am nervous about the situation. Well, you're not trusting God at that moment. If we have faith, we will not have fear. And it makes a great deal of difference how we respond. Any kind of crisis you can choose whether you will trust God or not. And the choice really does matter. See, if you don't trust God, there's a couple things you're going to miss out on. You're going to miss out on, first of all, His peace. You're not going to have His peace in the midst of the trouble. But not only that, but you will not have His help. You will not have His guidance. A lot of times people in their fear will make decisions, wrong decisions, bad decisions, that may have negative consequences. That's what Isaiah is saying to Ahaz. If you will not believe, you will not last. Ahaz does not trust in God. He is not going to trust that God can help him in the midst of this crisis. In fact, he's going to put his trust in Assyria. He says, well, I'm going to get Assyria to come and help me in this crisis. And Isaiah is telling him that's a bad decision. Assyria is not your friend. And they're going to cause trouble. So as believers, we have to decide in any crisis... Will you trust God? And we have every reason to trust Him and not be afraid. And so we want to consider, what is it about our God that we trust in, that we believe, whereby we don't have to be afraid? I want to give you three things from these uh, verses this morning. And the first thing is this. As believers, we have no reason to fear the present because God is with us. That kind of makes all the difference, doesn't it? I mean, if God is with you right now, whatever it is that you're going through, you have no reason to fear. Kind of like a little boy who goes to school every day, and, and there's a bully that meets him down on the corner. Big, tough guy. And every day takes his lunch money or uh, threatens to beat him up. And every day he goes to school and he's scared of that bully. And then one day his big brother finds out about it. Big brother, big brother. And he says, listen, I'll go with you. And so he's got his big brother right there with him. Do you think there'll be a difference in the way he approaches that corner with his big brother right there with him? I'm not worried about this bully because my big brother is with me. And the reality is if God is with us, we have no reason to fear no matter what's going on. This is the message that Isaiah gives to Ahaz. If you look at verse 10, it says, Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as shale or high as heaven. So here God knows that Ahaz, he doesn't believe. So he says, Ahaz, I want to help you out. I want to show you that I really can't handle these two kings without any trouble. You should just ask for a sign. I mean, ask for anything your little peanut brain can possibly fathom. And whatever it is, whatever that sign is, I'll do it. And I'll prove to you that I can handle this crisis. That's quite a proposition. And in verse 12, though, it says, But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Now, this is just so much uh, you know, false piety, because Ahaz does not trust in God. He is a wicked king. He has no intention of trusting God. And so he says, well, you know, you're not supposed to test God. You're not supposed to be asking for sons. But what if God tells you to ask for a son? Then you're testing God by not asking him. 
for the son. That's what he says in verse 13. Then he said, listen now, house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men? That you will try the patience of my God as well? You're going to try God's patience and refuse to do what he says? So in verse 14, he says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a son. You want to ask for a son? All right, fine, I'll give you one anyway. He says, behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. And we know that that name means God is with us. What a name that is, a name that calms our fears. God is with us. We know ultimately the fulfillment of that is in the coming of Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 1, Matthew specifically quotes this verse right here. As he talks about the birth of Jesus and how he was born of the Virgin Mary. He, his name will be called Emmanuel, which is God with us. Well, what an awesome uh, thing that is. That our God, Jesus Christ, who is God, came into this world to be with us. And Jesus came to walk among us. And Jesus came to identify with us and ultimately to go to the cross. And on that cross to take all of our sin upon himself. To die in our place. To die the punishment that we deserve for our sin. And then rise again from the dead. So that if we would be willing to come to him in, in repentance and faith. We would put our trust in him. That we could be forgiven of all of our sins. And listen, we could be reconciled to God. You see, sin separates people from God, and when you think about it, that's really the source of all anxiety. Why is there so much anxiety in the world? Because there is a sense of separation from God. In the very beginning, when God made man, and man walked with God there in the garden, the man and the woman, there's no reason to fear. They're with God. But when sin came in, there was a separation. And now man is like on his own out here. There's no foundation. He's got no security. What's he going to do in this world? How's he going to make it? And he, and he feels that sense of insecurity. And there's fear. There is anxiety. And on top of that, because of his sin, he's in danger of the judgment of God. And so there's great fear. But the good news is this. That Jesus came to resolve that separation issue. And through his death and resurrection, he makes it possible for us to be reconciled to God. When you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will come into your life, take up residence within, within us. And he is with us. And he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. No matter what you're going through, he says, I'll be right there. What an awesome thing that is, Emmanuel. There's a name that calms our fears. So you understand that as believers, we are not exempt from difficulties, we are not exempt from trials, we are not exempt from the crises that come. Uh, it's not just unbelievers who are going through this time, all believers are going through this time. But the difference is this, for us as believers, God is with us. See, that makes all the difference because He's there to help us. Whatever we're going through, He's there to comfort us. He's there to, to guide us. Kind of like, you know, in my house, I'm not really very mechanically inclined. I'm not really a good home repair. You know, if I start trying to fix something, be afraid. Because who knows how that's going to turn out. And, you know, if I was trying to fix something and something went wrong, oh boy. I would be afraid because I don't think I would know how to fix it. What am I going to do? But, you know, if I had somebody there in my house who knew all about those kinds of things, knew how to fix things. And something went wrong. Well, I wouldn't worry at all. He knows what to do. He'll fix it. And the thing that I love about being a child of God is whatever I'm going through, I may not know about a lot of things, but God is with me. He knows how to fix it. He knows what to do. And so I have no reason to fear. That is the message that, that God gives through Isaiah. It's true today. It was true then. I said the uh, ultimate fulfillment of that promise is in the person of Jesus. But there was a child that would be born in Isaiah's day. Many people believe it was uh, his wife who would give birth to a son. And in verse 15 it says, He will eat curds and honey. At the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. Isaiah could look at that son. There is a man 
Whatever was going on, hey, God is with us. We are reminded to Him. There's no reason to fear. But the second thing that I want to say is this. Why we have no reason to fear. We have no reason to fear the future. Because God is in control. So let's jump over here to chapter 8 and look there at verse 1. It says, And the Lord said to me, Take for yourself a large tablet and write on it in ordinary letters. Swift is the booty, speedy is the prey. Now, what does this message mean? This message is about what is getting ready to happen. How is it that God was going to deal with these two kings while they were no threat at all, while they wouldn't be around very long? Well, the, the major superpower of Assyria was going to come into those two lands and just devastate uh, those lands, destroy those lands. When they come, they'll be swift to, uh, to plunder those lands. That's what this message is about. And so God is telling Isaiah what is going to happen. And in verse 2, he says, And I will take to myself faithful witnesses for testimony. Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah. He wants witnesses to what he is writing. Uh, to say, yes, he is, he is writing this at this moment. Now, many believe that these uh, two witnesses were not even believers. And uh, when this would all come about, just exactly like God said, and Isaiah says, see, see, I wrote it down right here. And they'll say, well, you must have written that down after the fact. That's always what the skeptics want to say. But do you want to know what is one of the greatest proofs of the truthfulness of the Bible? It is fulfilled prophecy. There is no other book, religious or otherwise, that has fulfilled prophecies like the Bible, where things are predicted and they happen just exactly like they are predicted. Now, there's some amazing prophecies in the Bible. You read the book of Daniel, and Daniel was told centuries before of world kingdoms that were going to come upon the world scene, and, and, and it all happened just exactly like Daniel said. And so, of course, the skeptics, they come along and say, well, nobody could have written that ahead of time. They must have written that after the fact. And so Daniel didn't write it. Somebody came along later. That's always what the skeptic says. But think about the prophecies concerning Jesus. All these Old Testament prophecies perfectly fulfilled in the New Testament. A lot of people say, well, you know, the Bible, ah, it's just written by men. That's ah, just a bunch of fairy tales. You can't trust any of that. And so man somehow managed to figure out how to fulfill all those prophecies in Jesus. It's just grasping at straws. And our God is the only one that can predict the future because he's the only one who knows the future. And so what Isaiah is saying here is, I want you to witness this ahead of time. So that when it happens, you'll know I told you about it ahead of time. See, our God knows the future. And therefore, we can trust in Him. And He can take care of the future. And God gave Isaiah a son there in verse 3. He says, so I approached the prophetess. Many believe that would be his wife. And she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said to me, name him my hair shall a hash Now you thought she or to shoot was bad. I do like to have that name. Uh, and the name simply means swift is the booty, speedy is the prey. Isaiah could look at that son and say, you know what? God knows the future. And everything's going to happen just exactly like God said. And so the question is, again, will you trust God? Will you trust Him that He knows the future and He's in control of the future? Many in that day were not willing to trust God. If you look at verse 5, it says, again, the Lord spoke to me further saying, Inasmuch as these people have rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh. Uh, Shiloh was a place where the tabernacle at one time was set up. And, and so here he's talking about how the, these people have rejected God. He's described as gently flowing waters. The God of peace. The God who can take care of his people. And they have rejected him. And so they rejoiced in Raisin and the son of Ramaliah. They put their trust in elsewhere. He says, Now therefore, behold, the Lord is about to bring on them the strong and abundant waters of the Euphrates, even the king of Assyria and all his glory. And so they wouldn't trust God, and so God will bring Assyria against them. You see, God is the one who's in control. 
He was not only in control of those two kings who were coming and threatening Judah, but he's in control of Assyria as well. He goes on to talk about how Assyria, when they conquered those lands to the north, they were also going to come down into the land of Judah. It says in the end of verse 7, It will rise up over all its channels and go over all its banks. Then it will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass through. It will reach even to the neck. And, and the spread of its wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. That is, in the future, Assyria was going to come into the land of Judah, destroy a, a, a lot of that land, and come right up to Jerusalem with the intent of conquering Jerusalem. But it's not going to happen. He says, uh, this land is Emmanuel's land. God is with us, and God's in control. In verse 9, he says, Be broken, O peoples, and be shattered. And give ear all remote places of the earth. Gird yourselves, yet be shattered. Gird yourselves, yet be shattered. He's talking here to the nations. And he's saying, you can make your plans. You can get ready for whatever you want. He says, but God's in control. And today, North Korea can do whatever they want. They can make whatever plans they want. But I'm telling you, God is in control. China can make whatever plans that they want. But God is in control. Russia, Iran, whoever can make whatever plans they want to make. But I'm telling you, God is still in control in this world. And he was in control of Assyria in that day. In verse 10, he says, devise a plan, but it will be thwarted. State a proposal. But it will not stand, for God is with us. Assyria said, we're going to come in. We're going to conquer Jerusalem. It's going to be no problem. It's like we've conquered everything else. Oh, you're not big enough to stand against us. We're going to take you down, Jerusalem. But God says, no, it's not going to stand. And so he says to Isaiah in verse 11, Thus the Lord spoke to me with mighty power and instructed me not to walk in the way of his people, saying, You are not to say it is a conspiracy. In regard to all that this people call a conspiracy. And you are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. God tells Isaiah, don't you be looking around and listening to all of what people are saying around you. All of their conspiracy theories. Theories is another word for conspiracy. Everybody's got a theory about what we should do. About what's going to happen. And many people are afraid. They say, oh, what if this happens? And oh, this devastating thing is going to happen. And many people are afraid and they say, oh, what's going to happen? Everything's going to be shut down. And oh, yeah, this is what's going to happen with the economy. Oh, we're not going to have food. And ah, you know, and, and by the way, if you listen to too much media, you'd probably be scared to death because the media is designed to make it sound as bad as it possibly can because that's what gets ratings. And so be careful who you listen to because so much of what's out there today, the theories that are out there today, designed to create fear. He says, don't listen to all that, Isaiah. In verse 13, he says, it is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy. He shall be your fear and he shall be your dread. Fear God, the one who sits upon the throne over the universe. He's the one who has all power. Fear him. And there isn't any person, there isn't any circumstance that is more powerful than God. You don't have to fear anything or anyone. You should fear God. We should look to Him. We should trust in Him. Because no matter what happens, He's in control. People may say, oh, what are we going to do if this happens? Oh! You know what we'll do? What if they shut down the grocery stores? What if we don't have any money? What are we going to do? Tell you what we're going to do. Trust God. I'm going to pray. Reminds me years ago uh, when cell phones were just coming out. You know, all this technology stuff. You know, I'm always behind the times. But all these cell phones, they were just beginning to come out. I didn't have one. People said, oh, you need to get a cell phone. Everybody needs to get a cell phone because, you know, you need it for emergency purposes. I mean, what if you get out there and you break down on the road somewhere and you're out in the middle of nowhere? Then what are you going to do? You don't have a cell phone. Of course, maybe you won't have service out there. But that's another story. But they say, oh, you got to have it just in case of emergencies. So what would you do if you were out there and you broke down in the middle of nowhere? Uh, what did they do 30 years before? <laughs> cell phones. You might just have to pray. There's a novel concept. <laughs> Does God know where you are? And I remember there was one time, I wasn't so much out in the middle of nowhere, but I was on Schweitzer Road in between Leestown Road and 460. And my truck broke down. My old red Mazda truck. Loved that truck. But it had some ice in the fuel line. That's ultimately what the problem was. And it froze up and it wouldn't go. So I just came to a stop and I sat there and I said, well, what am I going to do? I mean, I, I was thinking I'm going to have to go out there and go 
from somebody's house or whatever. I mean, I, I'm sure there was a way that I could have figured it out, but what was interesting to me is before I even had time to really think about what I was going to do, oh, no, some guy pulled up right beside me, knew exactly what was wrong, said, pull your truck back up into this driveway, took me where I needed to go, tell me what, told me what I needed to do, and everything was solved within that day. It's just a reminder to me that no matter where you are, I don't know the future. I don't know what's coming down the pipe a month from now, two months from now, but I know this, that I have a God who knows the future, and I have a God who's in control of the future, and my God can take care of me, whatever the situation is. In fact, you know what God did with Assyria? Assyria, with all of its uh, boasts, how they were going to come and destroy Jerusalem. Yeah, they came right up to Jerusalem. In the days of Hezekiah, in the future, they came right up there, and they began to say, we're going we're to take you down. You know what Hezekiah did? He did two things. Number one, he called for Isaiah. He wanted to hear the word of God. Number two, he prayed. He got on his face before God. I mean, they had to call on God. God, we're not big enough. We can't handle this. And he called on God's help. And you know what God did? True story. You can read about it. He sent an, uh, an angel through the camp of the Assyrians, and 185,000 of them died in one night. The king got up the next day, looked at the devastation on the field, all his troops, uh, so many of them that were dead, and he said, whoa, and he got up and went home. And he didn't last much longer. He went back home, and he died shortly thereafter. I don't know what the situation is. I don't care how bad it looks. I don't care how impossible it looks. Like, what are we going to do? There's no other options. There is a God who is able there is a God who is all powerful and he knows the future and he knows where we are and he's able to take care of us. And so we as believers should trust in him. And that's what Isaiah says among his disciples in verse 16. He says, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. He says, and I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. See, he, he, he's going to go through this time. It's a time of crisis and kind of a time when God is dealing with his people. And I believe God is dealing with our world today. Our world that has said we don't need God. We can handle everything without God. I'm telling you, God can shut down everything. God can take away everything that we're trusting in. And he says it's a time when God was hiding his face from the house of Jacob. And Isaiah's going through the time as well. He says, what am I going to do? i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to wait for the Lord. He says, I will eagerly look for him. He's got his eyes on the Lord. He's not listening to anything else. He says, I'm trusting in him. He says, behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. He says, I even look at his children and the names of his children. And he says, well, I know God's in control and I know he's going to take care of me. I know he's going to lead me in the way that he wants me to go. And so I don't have any reason to fear he says in verse 19, when they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter. Oh, everybody's trying to figure out what we should do. Where do we look to for answers? And he says, should not the people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law, to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. If they don't speak according to the word of God, it is because they have no understanding. Our God is the only one who knows the future. He is the only one who's in control of the future. Look to him, trust in him, and there is no reason to be afraid. So we have no reason to fear the future because God is in control. But the final thing I want to say this morning, and I love this one. As believers, we have no reason to fear eternity because God has saved us. As you come to chapter 9, Isaiah begins to look into the future to a time of hope. In verse 1, he says, There will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea. On the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. And he's talking about in the northern kingdom, the land of Naphtali and Zebulun. And they were just devastated by uh, Assyria. But he talks about a future time when the light will once again shine on that land. In verse 2, he says, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. And that verse is quoted also in the book of Matthew. As Jesus began his earthly ministry, and his ministry at, in the beginning was concentrated in Galilee, and he traveled all around 
that area. And he came preaching his message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was a message of salvation. Jesus came to bring that salvation. And so the light was shining. Jesus came into the world, the one who would die for our sins, rise again from the dead. And so there was hope, and hope that would bring great joy. And it talks about the joy that they would have because the Lord has come. Look what he says in verse 6. He says, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. Now there's a government you can trust in. Uh, you know, no problem with Jesus being on the throne. And, and then it says, and his name will be called. These are these names. Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Eternal Father. The Prince of Peace. All oh, don't those names calm your fears. Uh, our God, his name is the Wonderful Counselor. That means he knows everything. He's on mission. There's not a problem in the world. He doesn't know what to do about that problem. He is the wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God. He is omnipotent. He has all power. There's no problem that's too big for him to handle. He's the eternal father. He's the father who cares for his children, takes care of their needs. He's the prince of peace. He's the one who gives us his peace. His presence is with us. We think of our God, the name of our God, and calms our fears. And then it says there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. His government's never going to end. All earthly governments come to an end. No matter how well they rule, they come to an end. But His government will never end. It is on the throne of David and over His kingdom to establish it with, and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. He says His kingdom will be forever and forever and forever. Jesus who came to save us. You put your trust in Him. He saves you and He saves you forever. We're going to be with Him in His kingdom. When Jesus, one day He's going to come to this earth and He's going to reign on this earth for a thousand years, we're going to reign with Him. Then when He creates a new heaven and a new earth, we're going to be with Him forever and ever and ever and ever. Listen, your eternity is taken care of us, believe me. He's got your eternity covered. He has saved us. I want to go back to that verse at the end of verse 9 in chapter 7 where he says to King Ahaz, if you will not believe, you surely will not last. The question I would have to anyone who may be listening to this message is this, are you in the kingdom? Are you in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ? Jesus says that unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The way to get into the kingdom is to repent of your sin, going your own way, and putting your trust in Jesus. And when you do, He'll come into your life, and, and He'll bring the kingdom into your heart. He'll set up His kingdom in your life. I mean, the kingdom of God will come alive in you. His peace, His joy, His, His purpose, everything, every good blessing He wants to give to you, His kingdom will come alive, and He'll be with us forever and forever. But you see, the question is, will you believe? Will you believe what God has done for you in Jesus? Will you trust in Him? See, it makes a difference. Because He says, if you will not believe, you will not last. There's no hope outside of Jesus. If you're putting your trust in anything else in this world, you may last a while, but you will not last ultimately. The only hope that anyone has is in Jesus. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our hope. And you need to put your trust in Him and you'll have His peace and you'll have His guidance and you'll have His blessing. You'll have His hope forever and ever. And if you're listening and you're a believer, Jesus has got your eternity. And if He's got your eternity, don't you think He can handle your presence? Whatever's going on at this moment, He's with us. He's right here with us. Every step of the way to help us. No reason to fear there. And if He's got your eternity taken care of, He certainly got your future taken care of. I don't know what's coming in the future, but I know who holds the future. He's in control. He has promised to provide for us.
Oh, the name, the name of our God calms our fear. Trust in Him. Do not be afraid. It's about Him. For Heavenly Father, I just come to you today and I thank you so much for the words of hope that you have in your word. Father, we can trust in you. You've got it all figured out. God, you've made a way for us to be saved in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, I just pray any person who's hearing this message who's not saved, that God will speak to their heart, that today they'll see how much you love them and they'll put their trust in you. God, I pray that you would uh, calm every heart of, of your people, those who may be nervous, those who may be worried, and maybe in situations where it looks like they have every reason to be worried. But Father, remind them that you are Emmanuel, that you are the wonderful counselor and the mighty God, and the eternal Father, and the Prince of Peace. And they can trust in you. Father, in heaven, please. We just give you praise. Father, we love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope you have a great day. Uh, on the beginning of this uh, Resurrection Week, I plan on sending out some emails each day, and just to think about what Jesus was doing in that final week of his life, leading up to the cross, and the resurrection. I just hope you'll read those things and, and think about that, try to give you a few insights. But I uh, plan on sending the first one out today, so you might be looking for that. But again, hope you have a great day. And I guess if I don't see you, hopefully I'll see you next week. If not, it'll be online as well. But uh, hope you have a great day.